at this point, I got to believe you're riding high. Your shift, trusting the process by shifting and go ahead in, in, into LA, it's working out great for you. You're still doing your, your, your comedy thing. How does, because your career continues to blossom at this point. And I was so proud of you when, and, and I might be skipping the timeline here because I don't know if the real came first or the HBO comedy special comes first. But the real was the real was this year was last year was last year. So I, I want to focus specifically on the comedy special for a second because it, as a comic, that's everybody that's dream. That that's mm -hmm. Mount Olympus. I get a one hour comedy special on HBO. Huge. How did that come to be? And if you don't mind, prior, and I'm not a comedian, but I just recently watched it, and I believe it was on HBO. Um, uh, 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 HBO Showtime, I'm not sure which one it was. But it, it, was, it was a limited series where they talked about the comedy store. Oh, did, yeah. Did you ever have the opportunity to perform at the comedy store or legendary right. venues like, like Caroline's? And what was that like? And how did it prepare you for your big debut on HBO? Bro. <laughs> Mad mud. Um, you know, stand up for me was um, a different route than it was for a lot of people because by the time I got to stand up, I knew my voice. A lot of people start stand up when they're substantially younger. So they're doing a lot of um, learning, a lot more like learning and shifting of gears than I was doing. What? Than I was doing by the time I made it to stand up. So my kind of route was a lot faster than a lot of folks um, because of that reason. And I think, you know, there's some folks who might feel like, oh, that's unfair, but whatever, fuck them. I mean, at the end of the day, like I was doing comedy in a lot of non-comedy spaces for a long time. So that by the time I started doing stand-up, I had de I was developed. And so when I was in New York, you know, you, there's a kind of, there's a path. You do what you do open mics and then, you know, you try and just kind of get put up on shows and you have to hang out at places and hope that someone doesn't show up so that you can get a spot. And, um, and then you get make friends with other comics who have shows and, you know, try and get them to put you up and give you a spot. And it's a process. And I always say you can't skip steps, but you can speed them up. And, you know, because not everybody needs the same amount of time at different phases. Like, I didn't need to do open mics for four years. <laughs> I did open mics for four weeks. And I was like, oh, okay, I've had enough of listening to white boys say a bunch of racist shit and think it's funny. Um, so scene. And I went forth just with this mindset of like, I'm going to prove to these people because a lot of folks felt like I was just doing stand up because I was a known name in other spaces. And now I was trying to just kind of add something. And it was like, no, this is a craft. And like everything else I do, I want to learn the craft of comedy. Um, and I was obsessed with comedy since a kid. So it wasn't to their surprise, like this wasn't just some like, new shiny novelty thing. This was something that I had always respected so much. That's why I didn't just take it lightly to get in there. But long story short, when I um when I came to California, you know, the thing about stand-up is it's a real family in a way that hip hop doesn't operate. I feel like with comedy, like people look out like your people look out for you. Mm -hmm. Um I feel like in hip hop it never felt like that. It always felt more so like every man for themselves. And it's not to say that that isn't the case for others, but that was like, it wasn't my experience. I didn't feel like in hip hop, like there was folks who were as willing to be like, hey, over here, they have da 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 da. Um, more so people are like, oh, shh, don't tell nobody because I want to get it for myself. Like that's more so the vibe. And I, in stand up, it was like, I moved to LA and my homegirl, Sam J, shout out to Sam J, who just got her own show on HBO. She was like, oh, I know the booker at the improv 
they're having, they're opening a new room. I'm gonna introduce you to them so you can maybe get a show over there. She didn't have to do that. <laughs> like, and by me having my own show at the improv when I got here, it became it became um a tool of currency for me to get other spots. Because mm-hmm. now you can barter. Hey, I'll put you on my show at the improv if you put me on your show at the Virgo, you know, at the Virgil. I'll put you on my show if you put me on your show at the comedy store. And so having that was like a priceless, a, a priceless like asset. And uh, and I just built from there. And for what it's worth, if you funny, people fuck with you, period. Like, cause they, they you know, they like, oh, okay, you funny. So we could, we could be funny together, great. And um, the long and short of how I got my special was because Jesse Collins, who produces, you know, BT Awards and Soul Train Awards, and he produced the new edition um, movie on BT, and he that special that I think is amazing on at Netflix, uh, 2020 is Trash. Jesse Collins and I had met at an event at my agency, and we just hit it off, like on some like homey, you know, laughing at the same jokes type shit. And we just stayed cool. Um, and that's the other thing. Like when I make connections with people, I make real connections with them. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like there's some people that you're just like industry acquaintances, you see them out, you say hi, but there's other people you're like, oh nah, we, we on the same vibration. Mm -hmm. So he was in a meeting at HBO and they were talking about a bunch of other people. And he took it upon himself to be like, I don't know why you tell me about all these people. You need to be looking at Amanda Seals. That was Thanksgiving 2018. I had a, I was shooting my special Thanksgiving 2019. Now it's not to say that they just were like, oh, perfect. You know, like I still had to work my ass off. I had to sell out, you know, seven shows at Caroline's and they came to the shows at Caroline's and they were like, oh my gosh, we've never seen a standing ovation in the middle of a show. Um, you know, like I had to really impress and, and, and stay consistent. And to your Sean Prez, Amanda is fearless. Nina. Rosenstein, the head of pro, the head of uh, specials at C- at HBO, she came to Smart, Funny, and Black when we were doing a show out there at the New York Comedy Festival, and she's like, "Amanda, how are you? It was great to meet you." And I was like, "Nina Rosenstein, the woman who will not give me my special." And she was like, "Amanda, what are you talking about? That's not it at all." And I was like, well, y'all just keep jibber jabbering and won't make a date, won't send an offer. So what are we even doing? I was like, I don't want to keep having conversations. Y'all either going to give me the special or not. Next week I had an offer. Oh my God, that's beautiful. That's- Actually, no, next day. Next day I had an offer. Next day. Wow. But the other thing is this, and I want to just say this to folks, because I know that there's some people that look at me and they're like, she's too much. Da-da-da-da. That's your opinion and that's fine. But there's other folks that when they see somebody who can back it up, they're inspired by that. They see that as insurance because they know, okay, she's not talk. Like the woman came and saw me at my own sold out shows. So I'm not just talking on my ass. Like you hear at my sold out shows. So in those moments, it's not that you're being pushy and you're also not asking for them to want you. You're just stating what you deserve. And I've always felt like we get talked out of doing that. Like you can state what you deserve. It doesn't mean you gotta be rude about it. It doesn't mean you gotta be stank. It doesn't mean you gotta burn a bridge, but you can just state like, this is how I feel about what I deserve. Take it or leave it. Cause if she hadn't given me the special, I was gonna figure out how to do it regardless. Yeah, but that comes down to a fundamental belief in self in understanding your own worth. And I think that far too often, especially in the industry that we're in, um, any uh, uh, area of entertainment, people look at it as they're too busy looking for validation from someone else. Mm -hmm. When they should be looking, okay, maybe you don't see my worth but I know who I am and what I'm capable of. And even if that means me taking a little longer to get to the finish line, yes. investing a little bit of my money, I'm still going to get there. 
I'm not yeah. looking for a handout. I'm not looking. I'm happy if, if if somebody validates me, but that is not ultimately what is going to decide if I ever arrive at that finish line. I'm getting there one way or the other. You know, what I think about often in like 2000 and I want to say maybe like five or six, I was emailing. Well, this is the days of the side of sidekicks. So it was like I was two waying uh, back and forth with Hove about an interview. And I said, one day you're going to hire me. And I think about this so often because I'm like, you corny ass. Like, <laughs> because now I think back, I'm like, fuck out of here. I don't need you to hire me, nigga. Like, and, you know, like, but that at that time, that was the ceiling of my dream, right? Like, and over time, I cut through that ceiling and I broke through that ceiling and I had new aspirations. And that was as my worth my self-worth and my self-empowerment grew, I created new spaces that of, of, of ambition that I wanted to step into. But ultimately, and I talk about this in my book, Small Doses, Potent Truths for Everyday Use, now available um, on Audible as well. Uh, you know, like there's your market value and your self-worth. And sometimes the two aren't the same. Like when I first moved to LA, my self-worth was up here and my market value was about here. I knew that I was at the level of all these folks out here, but my work only showed that I was right here. And so I had to make a conscious effort and decision to get work that would elevate my market value to my level of self-worth. So you can be an amazing actor, but if you're only doing reality shows, Nobody knows that you're an amazing actor. You don't have the credits. You don't have the proof. You don't have the market value. You can be an incredible a &R, but if you only keep doing safe projects that don't really go nowhere or that are just kind of like basic, ain't nobody going to know that you got some like dope ass visionary skills about you. But a lot of us don't see that. We just feel like everybody's supposed to see what we have within ourselves, even though we haven't demonstrated it. So I had to like really swallow a pill when I first moved here and understand like, it don't matter how much work you did in New York, these people don't care. <laughs> you know, you, you got a dope quote and I actually wrote it down and I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna read it because it goes to exactly what you just said. I was gonna bring it up. And even as, you know, we, we come to, to the end of this, because I don't know how much time you have, but I, I was gonna get it in and I think it fits right at this point. You said, I did a lot of work that was important to me, but it didn't elevate my market value. That, that's a gem within itself. <laughs> because yes, we can go out there as individuals and we can do so much work that's important to us, but there's a big difference between what's important to you and the work that actually elevates your market value and is important to the masses. And I like the way you just put it and just broke it down because you, 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 you took this quote that you said and you really elaborated on it in a way that I think people need to hear. They need to understand that there's a big difference between just doing work that is it might be important to you but it's not necessarily going to position you in the market and have people looking at you as this is a commodity we should be investing in. And if you have an agent or a manager or a PR person, they need to be able to know that and um, guide you in that. And that's a really important way of knowing if you have somebody in that position who is doing their job properly. Are they able to identify where you are, where you want to go, and what needs to be done to get there. Because I've had all the above, the PR, the agents, the managers, and many times they couldn't. They couldn't. Like they have their contacts. And so they're like, I'm just going to try and plug you into my stuff. But a lot of times they're not able to really be the visionary of like, okay, this is your unique route that you need to take. 
And so oftentimes like you, and I, I, I feel like, and it's a very music industry thing, but a lot of performers like want this manager who's gonna come and save them. Like they're gonna come and Harriet Tubman them to, to, to freedom. It's not real. I don't care who you are. I have never heard of an artist who got there solely because their manager figured it out for them. You have to be the visionary of your dream. Your manager works for you, your agent works for you, your publicist works for you. Doesn't mean you demean them, it doesn't mean you talk down to them, but they work for you. What's up guys? Thanks for sticking with me to the end of the video. Truly appreciate you. If you like anything you heard here today, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. And if you know anybody that can benefit from this message, feel free to share. Peace and love.